For those of you that may be new today, or for those of us that can't remember much, I think that covers us all. Um, Let me give us a brief recap. We started out uh, five weeks ago with the idea that we would look at several of the hymns of the Christian faith with the purpose of learning the stories of examining some of the theology contained in them, of pointing ourselves back to the Scripture and being encouraged and blessed by the fact that God in His great mercy and providence has given us the gift of music within the context of the church to convey and express all that He means to us and all that He's done for us and all of the hope that we have in Him. As Martin Luther said, beautiful music is the art of the prophets that can calm the agitations of the soul. It is one of the most magnificent and delightful presents that God has given us. Next to the Word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. Or how about this quote from the 16th century Scottish theologian David Dixon, it is not sufficient to offer the empty vessel of our joy unto God or our singing voice in musical tune only, but also it is required that we fill our joyful voice with holy matter and good purpose, whereby God only may be reasonably praised. So to that end, we've looked at five hymns thus far. Great is Thy Faithfulness, written by Thomas Chisholm. Come Thou Fount of Every every Blessing, uh, written by Robert Robinson. It is Well with My Soul, by Horatio and Anna Spafford. Be Thou My Vision, which comes to us from way back in the 6th century as an Irish poem. And then last week, Blessed Assurance, by that prolific hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. And we have four more to go, at least this time around. I have had so many of you telling me how this has blessed you that we might do another series in the future uh, on hymns of our faith. But for this series, we'll uh, have four more today and three more leading us to the end of, of October. Today's hymn is, as we have sung and as you will sing in a moment, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. And one of the interesting things about this hymn is that it is included in every hymnal of every denomination and with almost universally similar text. That, in and of itself, is very rare. It's also rather difficult to find um, a hymn that is sung by the same tune almost all the time. And uh, the tune for this song is Nicaea. I'll talk about that just briefly in a moment. Um, But... Holy, Holy, Holy was written by a pastor. A lot of our hymns that we've looked at so far have been written by ordinary folks. Uh, But this is one that was written by a pastor, a gentleman by the name of Reginald Heber. And Reginald was a bright young man. He translated Latin into English by the time he was seven years old. So for those of you still having difficulty with English, uh, get on with the program. Um, He would go on to Oxford University at 17, and after graduation, he would become the rector or the pastor of his father's church in a little village in the east, uh, excuse me, in the west of England called Hodnet. He would remain there as the rector of that little church for 16 years until he was appointed uh, the bishop of Calcutta, India by the Anglican Church in 1823 at the young age of 40. Heber wrote the hymn, Holy, 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 specifically for Trinity Sunday. And here at Mountain Hill, we don't tend to be as rigid in following the church calendar as maybe some of your church backgrounds do. But uh, Trinity Sunday falls eight weeks after Easter. And he desired that this hymn would be sung either directly before or directly after the church recited the Nicene Creed. Again, as not a liturgical church, maybe you're not familiar with that creed, or maybe the name rings a bell, but you're not all that certain about it. And that leads us to the tune name of the song, Nicaea. So if you had your hymnals open, I'm not asking you to do that, but if you had it open down at the bottom on the left is the hymn writer and the 
writer of the tune, and then over on the right is the name of the tune. And I've talked a little bit about that. The tune name for Holy, Holy, Holy is Nicaea. And I don't want to bore you with a lot of church history, although I love church history and history in general. But in A.D. 312, uh, you might have heard of this man. His name was Constantine. He was the emperor of Rome at the time, and he issued uh, the Edict of Milan, and that ruling granted all people in the Roman Empire the right to follow any religion that they desired. And that was huge, especially among Christians, because up until that time, Christians had been especially persecuted. And as Christianity grew in popularity under uh, Constantine's reign as emperor of Rome, there was another problem that popped up. And that problem was an increase in false doctrine, heresy, contradictions of who God is and who Jesus is as outlined in the scripture and in the early church. And so in A.D. 325, Constantine called a special council of priests and bishops. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 priests and bishops, along with their entourages from all over the Roman Empire. So they came to this town in Turkey uh, called Nicaea. Uh, about 1,800 to 2,000 people. That counts all the entourage. And they gathered in this town of Nicaea, and for almost a month, they met together to discuss various topics within this faith that we call Christianity. And among the two most significant things that was discussed were the Arian controversy and the establishment of the date of Easter. If you ever wanted to know, why is it that we celebrate Easter when we do? It goes back to this council. They said, oh, the church is celebrating Easter way too many different times. Let's, let's consolidate that. And so coming out of this council, we have the establishment of the date of Easter and the addressing of the Arian controversy. Now, the Arian controversy centered on this false teaching that said Jesus was created by God. That he was not always existing eternally like God, that he was created by God, and, and so much so that he wasn't even co-equal with God. He was under God, and he wasn't of the same nature as God. And so long story short, one of the products of this first council of Nicaea was this Nicaean Creed that Reginald Heber wanted this song to center around. And it was a very important statement of the early church and of our faith. And many of the church backgrounds that you come from still to this day recite the Nicaean Creed. Maybe not every week, but certainly uh, on a regular basis. And that leads me to another thought we might do a series on that or look at that sometime in the future. So that's where the tune gets its name from a little town in Turkey um, where all of these folks gathered because of Constantine calling them together to address some of these problems. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. You heard Judy read it earlier, this beautiful passage from uh, the prophet Isaiah, and I'm glad that she did because I, it's difficult for me to read Isaiah 6 without becoming emotional. Just the imagery and the words that the prophet Isaiah gives to us. Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm just going to read for us the first four verses. Uh, Judy read to verse 7. I'm just going to read back to verse 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. We'll come back to some of this, but I want to begin this morning by trying to help us grasp and understand the significance of this word, holy. What it means in connection with, with God. Someone once said that you can't truly know yourself until you truly know God, and you can't truly know God until you understand that He is holy. 
So what does it mean that God is holy or that anything is holy for that matter? I believe that most of us today, particularly Christians, tend to use the term holy as a synonym for moral purity or righteousness. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it might be a little misleading. You see, the primary meaning of the word holy is separate. That which is holy is that which is other, that which is different from something else. So when the Bible speaks of God's holiness, the primary thrust behind those statements refers to his transcendence. It refers to God's magnificence. It refers to his being higher and more superior than anything in the created world. Let me See if I can give you a few examples. The book that some of you are holding in your hand right now, what does it say on the front cover? It is the Holy Holy Bible, meaning this book is different from any other book that you're going to pick up today or tomorrow or forever. It's different. It's other than. I'm not sure if you know this, but tomorrow is Columbus Day. What do we call that? It's a holiday or a holy day, meaning not that it's consecrated necessarily, but it's supposed to be different than all the other days in the calendar. Our holidays are other than, they're different. Some of you may be familiar with the name R.C. Sproul. Dr. Sproul is currently the co-pastor of St. Andrew's Chapel in uh, Sanford, Florida. He was the founder of Ligonier Ministries up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he served as professor at Reformed Theological Seminary and Knox Theological Seminary, both of which are in Florida. And Dr. Sproul tells a rather humorous story about losing his cool with a seminarian one day in class. And he says, one time I committed the unpardonable sin as a seminary professor. You always hear people say there's no such thing as a dumb question, and that's true. As a professor, I always want to answer my students' questions with respect and dignity, and he he goes on to talk about the the only bad question is the one that you never ask because you don't get an opportunity to have an answer. And He said, but every now and then, uh, we really do get dumb questions. Nevertheless, you should treat people with dignity. But this one student, he said, I just, I I came unglued. I just lost it. He goes on to say, I was lecturing on Holy Communion, on the Lord's Supper. And this student's question wasn't so much a question as it was an expression of unbridled cynicism. So the student raises his hand and I acknowledged him and he says, what's the big deal with bread and wine? I mean, why do we have to do that? Why can't we just have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and Coca-Cola? And Sproul says with a grin on his face, that's when I lost it. I felt this rage flowing up from within my soul. He grated my sensitivity when he said that. And instead of giving him a polite and genteel and professorial response, I said, You want to know why we don't use peanut butter and jelly and Coca-Cola at Holy Communion? It's because Jesus didn't consecrate peanut butter and jelly and Coca-Cola. I was ready to kill him. (laughs) But it begs the question, why? Why was that such an affront to Dr. Sproul? What is it that makes the bread... And the wine so special? What is it that makes any moment in history so special? What is it that makes a piece of real estate holy ground? What is it that causes people like Noah and Abraham, Moses and Joshua and countless others to mark the ground where they're standing with altars? What is it that causes us to be drawn to something that's common? and yet is so extraordinary. It's not because of the intrinsic value of the objects themselves. Listen to me, folks. What makes something sacred, what makes something holy, is the touch of God upon it. When the one who is himself is different and other, touches that which is ordinary, it becomes extraordinary. When God touches you, when God touches me, 
we become uncommon. And so the difference between the profane and the holy is the difference between the common and the uncommon. It's the difference between the earthy and the heavenly. We're experiencing some very difficult days in our country. There's a renewed sense of racial tension. There's this growing disrespect for police and government authority. There's an anger, of skepticism towards Hispanics and immigration. And many people, even some of us, are showing signs of xenophobia. It's a real thing. I'm not making this up. This is a real fear, xenophobia. By the way, do any of you know what xenophobia is? It's the fear of strangers or foreigners. We have a tendency, you and I, to be frightened by people whose customs are different from ours. And the supreme form of xenophobia is the fear of being in the presence of the living God because He's so different from us. He's high and exalted. But to speak of God as holy isn't to only say that we're afraid of Him. At the same time, there's something that attracts us. There's something that draws us. There's something that fascinates us. We see this in Jesus. People flock to Him. They were drawn to Him, but at the same time, they were repulsed by Jesus. Holiness is at the very core of the character of God. Look back at verse 3 in what we just read from Isaiah 6. And what the seraphim say to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Folks, our God is holy. Think with me for a moment about the Lord's Prayer. We prayed it just a moment ago as we were concluding our prayer. That prayer can be, can be divided up into some lit, uh, literary categories. The address... Uh, the petitions and the benediction or the closing. Now, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer out loud, but I just want you to think about this. What's the first petition or request made in that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, here's the question. Is the hallowed be thy name part of the address? Or is the hallowed be thy name the first petition? You see, if it was part of the first address, then Jesus would have said this. When you pray, start this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed is your name. But that's not what he says. He says, no, when you pray, the very first thing that you do when you get on your knees is you pray, God, your name be holy. Folks, our God is different. Our God is other. Our God and our God alone is holy. Let me transition this into the importance of holiness. Go back to verse 1 in chapter 6 of Isaiah. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. This verse tells us a lot about the importance of holiness, where everybody else saw despair and discouragement and disillusionment and disappointment. Guess what Isaiah saw? He saw the king. Notice that there are two kings in this first verse. There's a dead king and there's a divine king. There's a mortal king and an immortal king. There's a human king and a heavenly king. One king has died as will all other kings. And there's another king that lives forever as no king can. Also notice how Isaiah sees the Lord. He doesn't see the Lord pacing back and forth in the courtroom of heaven, wringing his hands, barking out orders, breaking out into a cold sweat because King Uzziah has died. No. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he was sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. Isaiah saw clearly what you and I need to see in these difficult days. God is on the throne. His hands on the throttle. He's high and lifted up. He's above every ruler and circumstance. He's above every condition and problem and difficulty that we face. He's in absolute and complete control. Understanding the importance of holiness keeps things in our lives in proper perspective. The holiness of God helps us not to run around with our heads 
chopped off because God's in control. You might have also noticed in verse 1, the word Lord begins with the capital L, but it's finished with the lowercase O-R-D. But in verse 3 and in verse 5, the word Lord is all capitals. The reason for that is because there are two different Hebrew words behind the one English word, and that's the way that the translators are trying to point our attention to that fact. When the word Lord occurs in lowercase letters, the translator is indicating to us that the word behind it in the original language is the word Adonai. It's a title for God. Adonai means sovereign one. It's not the name of God. It is his title. In fact, it's the supreme title given to God in the Old Testament. But when Lord in all capital letters appears, it indicates the proper name of God, the name Yahweh. You might remember Moses in the desert. He's approaching this bush that's burning, and yet it's not being consumed. And he has this conversation with God, and God tells him to go to Pharaoh and tell him to set his people free. And he has this question of God. He says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? Well, what shall I say to them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you, sent me to you. The name Yahweh comes directly from God's words to Moses because the root of the word or the name Yahweh comes from to be. That's what God says. I am. And that's where we get the name Yahweh. So whenever you see Lord in all capitals, you're looking at the name of God himself as he gives it to us. He's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Jesus, when he comes onto the scene, is given the same title, Lord. The point I want us to see is that God, the God that Isaiah saw was Adonai. He was the sovereign God of this universe. We need to be reminded repeatedly in the days of darkness and difficulty, doubt and despair that you and I face that God is on the throne and everything is under control and the importance of holiness keeps our faith in perspective. It helps to keep things in perspective and it helps to keep our faith in perspective. Finally, Isaiah not only saw a sovereign God, he saw a sinless God. Look back at verses 2 and 3. Above the throne were seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two his feet, and two he flew. And one cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I can't read that enough. We need to be reminded of God's holiness. Do you see that in the song, the word holy is repeated three times? In Hebrew poetry... The way to emphasize something was by repetition. You and I can emphasize things by underlining things or putting it in italics or bold print or quotations around it or doing all sorts of other things. But in Hebrew poetry, the way that you emphasize something was to repeat it. In fact, uh, Jesus did this. You knew that uh, Jesus was a Jew. He was also a teacher. He was a rabbi. He had followers or disciples. And so as Jesus would walk around teaching... The disciples were listening. Even Jesus did this. You might recall, in John's Gospel, 19 times Jesus says, Truly, truly. Or in some of the older translations, Verily, verily, I say unto you. In the original language, what Jesus is saying is, Amen, amen. You know that word. We say it after we pray. What do we say? Amen. The meaning of the word, amen, is true. Indeed, I agree with you, God. Jesus didn't have to wait for the sermon to be over to get an amen. He just said, amen, agree with me right now and do it twice. But there's only one place in all of Scripture that a character of God is mentioned three times. It's holy, 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 holy. The seraphim were not crying out, power, power, power. The seraphim were not crying out, the chief idea of God's knowledge, omniscience, omniscience, omniscience. They weren't crying out His presence, omnipresence, omnipresence, omnipresence. They were crying, holy, holy, holy. He is a thrice holy God. Let me close with this. Several years ago, the survey was taken of seminary students in seven different seminaries. They were given two sentences to choose between. A bare choice. 
The statements went like this. God's love includes all people. And he desires that all should know him. That was statement number one. Statement number two was God is holy. Evil will not triumph. Of those submissions, which one was most descriptive of God? Only 18.5% indicated a preference that God is holy. 80% of the seminary students chose to indicate that God loves everybody. Now listen, I think it would be safe to say that in the world today, the ratio would be much higher. The Bible doesn't say that God is love, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. Please hear me correctly. I'm not saying that He isn't love. I'm not saying that He isn't mercy. But until we begin to understand the holiness of our God, we can't understand the other attributes of our God. His love and His mercy, His grace or His justice. Let's pray. God, we don't know who you are. 